Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I'm once more joined by my brother at arms, Mr. Royan. How are you doing, Royan? Dude, I'm doing I'm doing all right. I'm ready to, ready Heck to get into yeah. it. Yes, so we are back for Rings of Power Season 2, Episode 6. I think it's called Where Is He or something? It is. Um, it's called Where Is He? Perfect. So yeah, good way to end our week with uh, with the Rings of Power review. And so, uh, Royan, overall, before we jump into the, the good stuff and then the bad, um, you know, I, I thought this one was certainly not as strong as last week's episode, particularly because the Harfoots came back, <laughs> and we knew they would. Ugh. But uh, overall, yeah, you know, I thought it was oh, decent in some places. Um, we'll talk about, we'll get, we'll get into it. But overall, Royan, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, not nearly as good as last episode and we you know we were chatting a little bit about this earlier in the week we were catching some heat um as we expected to uh (laughs) for enjoying an episode of rap um understandable i got i get what you guys say but that episode was good legitimately it It was legitimately good and it was as we were afraid they could not keep it up man um yeah, um, yeah, but they're like I'm, I'm thinking back because I tried to read. Now that you mentioned that, I tried to read a lot of the comments and really decipher. It's like you know, are we biased? Is there something we we missed out on? The only thing where I'm like, All right, maybe there's some merit there that I hadn't considered like, as much as I maybe should have was um, just because of how bad other Rings of Power episodes have been. Just because of how much like my expectations are kind of on the ground, <laughs> just how low that bar is, maybe. I, I was super kind to it, but honestly, again, I still hold true to what Ryan and I said. It's like, even in that case, maybe it's still an eight out of ten. It's still, it was still really good, in my opinion. Yes, it was I, still really good. Well, what was crazy is about that episode to me is that it was able to be good without needing the structure of good episodes preceding it. Um, yeah. Which I think a lot of shows, you know, when you hear about shows and you like, oh, you look at the the average IMDb rating of every episode. It's like, oh, dude, every single episode of this TV show for like these three seasons straight is like an eight out of 10 or better. Like, is it really, is it really, or was everything going (laughs) on just making you so excited that you were enjoying this episode? So I just, Mm, I can understand that like the, the surrounding uh, episodes of a TV show, really can impact but i still feel like last week's episode of rob was good that said this week's episode had a much shorter list of things that were good which was what you actually asked me to talk about you i said so for just right off the top you know they 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 got me right at the beginning an iran deer scene where he is just the coolest uh oh yeah we just watch him (laughs) dispatch like four orcs with just the the pure speed, grace, and lethality that I fully expect from mm-hmm. a Tolkien elf. All right, like I don't understand. <laughs> Dude, he just it. like does this Jedi jump, and it's crazy. Like it, he just flips. I and look it's at awesome. this. I look at this man, and I see Legolas. Right, and I'm like, all right, yep. Arondir is the only real elf in this show, and I. At this moment, I have seen nothing to uh, <laughs> nothing to prove that wrong so far this season. I I agree, and honestly, like I don't see him as just legless either. He's got some. I now they kind of off screened some of this because of like the actress not coming back, but he has had some trauma, and so seeing the character kind of be three dimensional, deal with this stuff. I agree. It was just one quick scene where he was like tracking and figuring out what's going on. Um, cool stuff. Yeah, and then he I mean, did not reappear, which was a sign yeah. for me. Uh, <laughs> I will <laughs> yeah. say that at the end of that scene, there was something that I found silly in the moment and made a note of, which is like, instead of a, a writing out of orders, there's just a bad drawing of Aurigian. Um I'm not sure if they really wanted to try to do something with like a transition. Uh, either way, it didn't really fit. I didn't get it. Um if that was the point, I just don't understand why you don't just make it in black speech. Cause I like it when elves can like, can read black speech. It, it reminds you, it's like, these things are inherently related. They are a source. One is a corruption yeah. of the other. Um, True. Yeah. Which we get to see later when, 
when a corpse gets dumped and it's just such a mm-hmm. it's such a, a nice brutal scene up until like this moment where uh this elf who just keeps popping up a whole bunch in this season originally thought was just like a side character now probably not um Miranda, yeah. she's just like, what's it, what's it say? And I was just like, you can't read that. <laughs> is, that <laughs> is that not supposed to be black speech? Is that not supposed to be basically just almost a a cursed dialect of of your own language? And, like, <laughs> right? Well, and I mean, it, it's it's an interesting thing because like they started to figure this black speech out. I think after the One Ring was forged. Which we'll get into more in some of my problems with the episode, with the the show at large that continues to to kind of exist. Um, but I don't know if they'd be able to read black speech. I don't know if Adar ha- like speaks black. I think he does. Well, yeah, we'll get into that well, in a second because he says Uruk, it, I guess. But mm-hmm. I do not yeah, know. no, yeah, he he actually he does because he says like Urukai or Uruk, which means orc in black speech. And so they do speak it, I, I guess. And yeah, they carved it into the guy. So they speak it, even though it's like a Sauron invention, but they don't like Sauron, but they kept his, his dialect. But I, yeah, it's weird. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you dig beneath the surface and you find, oh, they probably didn't think too much about it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, other things that I enjoyed, the we get more scenes of uh, Sauron toying with Celebrimbor and you get to see a lot more of this visualization of how Celebrimbor who for all intents and purposes an inherently good elf could be led Mm -hmm. astray by Sauron and I like it I think it's good I think it's well done especially as compared to last episode it's a lot more forced right you get to see more of Sauron but the stress that he's Mm -hmm. putting on him allows him just a little bit more space where Celebrimbor is just not catching it like he like he needs to. Um, something that I took a note of, because I'm going to complain about it in the next section, um, is mm-hmm. Sauron's magic is very real and very seen. We get to yeah. see two major moments, one much more telling than the other with like the hammer appearing uh, on the shell. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I'm, I'm not afraid to admit it. I backed up and I was like, was that actually sitting there? It wasn't. Yeah. It's not. No, there. that, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's what I've seen other people do too. Yeah. They, they went through it and I checked, um, I double checked. And then later yeah. with like the whole fake outdoor scene. Okay. So Sauron's magic is very present, but it's mm-hmm. not nearly as in your face as we've yeah. seen other, other wizards magic in this show. Uh, <laughs> True, true. Last thing I want to I call out my boy, Elendil, his lines mm-hmm. so hard. His his ability to capture a scene in this episode, dude, he's doing his best. He's trying to carry this episode on his back. Um, but there's just a lot of silliness that kind of surrounds his his whole situation. So yeah. what do you think, Yoyce? What did you like about this episode? It, it continues to hammer home that... Um, and I agree with everything you, you said as well, but it, it hammers home the fact that technically this is such a well-made show um, and it's getting better and better, I think, with the seasons. So I saw some kind of backstage thing of how they did that transition between Sauron's um, illusion and the reality and like how because that was an unbroken edit and how they manipulated the light and all that stuff. Like I saw a bit of behind the scenes stuff. Incredible. This is a really well-made show in a technical standpoint. And and I look back at all of our reviews and stuff, and we, like, always say that. We say visually it's great. The music, it's like, I, I love Bear McCreary. I love his, I'll be honest, I love his God of War stuff a lot more than Rings of Power stuff. I don't know if it's because of the mixing and I don't hear it as much as, like, Howard Shore's music in the Lord of the Rings movies. I don't, I don't know. Like, I hear it, you know, from time to time when I'm watching, and it's, like, there, but... I've I've found stuff I'll say, and this is no slight to Bear McCreary, but it's, at least I'm not trying to be disrespectful to him. But I'll hear stuff that's like comparable from independent artists on YouTube, right? Just like there's a there's this Silmarillion album or inspired you know music inspired by the Silmarillion album on YouTube, and I'm like, yeah, it's like comparable to that in my opinion. There's some really good music beats, but it doesn't stand out in the same way. Still well made though. The visuals that um, yeah, just like 
the cinematography and all this kind of stuff, it's a technically fantastic show. And so how they transition between certain scenes in this episode, uh, between certain characters, um, and also how, like, the actors, the actors are really good. Kella Brimbor looking, like, with that kind of broken sense of hope and desperation when he's when he's looking at Anatar manipulate him is incredible. Like, the actors and all of them do such a good job. Um, I've got a note here, Anatar, the Lord of Riz, where he's like, <laughs> he's talking to, yeah, Mirandia and, and all this kind of stuff. And he's just being, he's just being so charismatic. And honestly, I was thinking about it this morning on my way to work. I'm like, oh, he's perfect for Sauron, for Anatar. I, I've gotten used to the wig now. And so now I get it. Like when we were talking when the trailers first dropped and stuff, it's like, ooh. It's going to be weird. We're used to seeing him as Halbrand, but now seeing the same actor. I will like, admit this that wig. seeing him in this episode made me feel like, okay, this is actually how this character was cast. Yeah. This is what he was cast for this moment. This, yeah. these scenes, like, uh, I, I get it. You know, I, here's yep. the casting with the Halbrand stuff. It was yeah. awkward. And the transition was, period was. was very weird, but now I see it. Yeah. I see the vision. All right, with this casting. I see, like, <laughs> they make him look tall, like I imagine Anatar to be, and kind of, like, daunting a little bit with, with how he appears in the robes and stuff. Kind of like the artwork that you would see of Anatar from even, like, the Shadow of War, Shadow of Mordor games and stuff. Just the artwork of that Anatar, like, it's, it, I think it's really good. So the acting is good. Elendil's trial, right, like you were saying, amazing. I'm starting to see Elendil now. Like, I'm glad they're giving him some time to shine. Um, right. He was, it was a little bit like unclear exactly which crimes he was like renouncing, but he wouldn't take our on as his leader. I, I will get into this in the yeah. other section. It, it's a bit contrived here and there, but I'm glad to see the, the actor and the character of Elendil shine the whole, like, um, if, if after all this, you see his pride, then I have nothing more to say. Dude, that's what I'm saying. Oh, his lines were so, so hard in this episode. So good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I, because honestly, they put him in an interesting position in the show. I was like, is he about to get Ned Starked? Like, <laughs> is he going to be put in a position where either he goes against his honor or he's like killed? And obviously he's not going to die because, you know, we know the story. But it's like, this is a really interesting. I don't know how he's going to get out of this. But then right when Tarmiriel shows up, I'm like, OK, now I know how he gets out of this like entirely. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I think there's there are some really good things. Um the dwarves kind of throwing out Anatar and, and kind of being manipulated by him. Pretty much any scene involving Anatar and him manipulating people is great. So I yeah, for me, that's a lot of a lot of the good stuff. Um, should we jump into the not so good stuff, the criticism? Yeah. Um, you want me to start? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with this. Uh, it's kind of cool that the show builds in bathroom breaks. Uh, you know, go to the kitchen breaks, all that kind of stuff with the, the Harfoots. Really cool that they do that. <laughs> I, I posted on Twitter yesterday. It was exactly what I was thinking. It's so funny because, like, I feel my mind just gets so disconnected the moment they show up. And it's, again, I'm fascinated that that happens. I'm fascinated in the fact that the plot line is so boring that actually I just, my, physically, I just pick up my phone the moment they come on. And I'm not even, like, trying to. Um, so I posted on Twitter is like that Homelander meme of him, like watching his own movie and, and like the, the dead face pan, right? Just like that. I posted that whenever a Harfoot scene comes on, I'm thinking about literally anything else. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, we can, we can go from there. Ryan, what, what do you oh, think about dude. all of this? Okay. So, um, I gotta be honest. So com- I don't know. I'm very torn on this episode. Because I think there yeah. are moments of it that are very good. And we just talked about a lot of moments that I really enjoyed. But there are other moments that tank it so hard for me. Mm-hmm. And I want to just start talking about some of those. Uh, and I'll try to start with the least egregious first. So with uh, the trial scene specifically. And kind of this whole Numenor plot line. I feel like we needed another hour in the oven to cook here, guys. Like... It yeah. feels like everything is happening so fast that I'm like, wait, what? Yep. Uh, you know, yep. we have Elendil moments and he's like, 
I I accept that you know I renounce my crimes, and I was like, okay, you you've been accused of some some a lot of stuff. Are you saying some right stuff. now you're like, yeah, man. I was committing treason. I was like, that's a weird thing <laughs> to be committing. It's like, unless you're just feeling broken right now, the next line of yeah. his mouth, but no, I will not accept you. He was like, all right, so we're back yeah. on the treason. Um, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and I almost expected the opposite where he's like, I did not commit any crimes. However, fine. I'll accept you as my ruler. Cause that to me seems a bit more loreful. Like he, he didn't love our but at some point, like, yeah, he, re- he recognized him as the leader of Numenor. So yeah. in the lore. So yeah, I almost expected the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah. I was, this entire scene was confusing to me. And then we go to the, the prison scene um, from him, which I thought was a lot better, mostly cause it was just him. It was just Alendil's actor. And I'm sorry, I don't know any of these people's yeah. names. Um, we'll get them at some point. Uh, but yeah, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I will say, even with the jail scene, like where he says the sea is always right. Oh my gosh, I I thought they left that behind in season one. The sea is always right. Again, that kills me because the sea drowned Elendil's wife. Right? It, like it's it's not like <laughs> oh, oh I I see what they were trying to do with the sea monster and everything and and maybe I plugging don't. in Olmo. Okay, let's, but, let's 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 I mean, talk about this for a second. Uh, the implication yeah. here is that the ancient Numenorians, all right. They have yet to be clear on how ancient Numenor is. Um, True. Oh, oh, 100%. <laughs> they've given us, <laughs> to our they've given us no background on Numenor as a concept. I think they had like a couple lines between Anatar and Celebrimbor, of all people, talking about how cool the Numenorians are compared to most men. Yeah. Um, but like the, the implication here is that the ancient Numenorians, maybe they didn't worship, maybe they didn't love it, but – summoned the sea monster on occasion to eat people as a, a way of trialing like and they've got their own pool set up for it what's going on guys <laughs> who are these people like <laughs> you can, in one I, breath I, I in get one that. breath you have the faithful being like our traditions are to the valar you know we are we are good people we stand with the valar and in the same breath it's like oh but actually um my great great granddad got eaten by a squid, so I can I know it wasn't squid, but <laughs> right. that said, no, I, the yeah. actual monster rad loved it. It was cool. I was just like, <laughs> "Why are you here?" And then it spat out Tarmiriel, and I'm like, "Why? Who are you, yeah. sea monster? Are you the same monster that attacked Galadriel and Sauron? If so." What's going on, boss? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I I agree that that does need more context. I guess what I'm saying by like, I get what they're trying to do with it. Like the Numenorians, they loved the Maiar of the sea. And again, this might all be not canon to the show and just canon to the books. I, I, like we discovered in the first few episodes review, it's like uh, reviews. How much of the Silmarillion is actually canon to the show? I have I have literally no idea. But they could bring in Ose and Uinen, who are the Maiar of the sea. And Uinen, they love, the Numenorians loved her because she was like the the Mariner's friend kind of Maya, where it's like, if we had a safe passage, it was because she allowed the waters and the wind and all, you know, she allowed the passage over the sea to be safe. Uh, versus um, Ose, who's like insane and like going, he is the storm of the sea, you know, and he almost, he turned to Melkor's side at one point and then turned back. Um, and so I don't know if they're trying to bring this in. It's like, we, we are, we use the sea as justice. And that's where it's like, the sea is always right. As much as I hate that line and it contradicts the show itself, the sea is always right. So we're going to use the sea as our judgment of good or, or not good. But again, like you say, we have no context. Who is the sea monster? What's it supposed to do? We have no lore behind it. We have Um, a photo. We have one picture in a book that has only been read by people we know are bad guys. Like, but also... Right, we have nothing to be like. Oh, this is real or not? And speaking, Yoisin, of you will like if we're bringing these Maiar into this, and we're bringing more like deities mm-hmm. of you know the ocean sphere uh, or any mm-hmm. deities. I don't even think they've name dropped Olmo at this point. Like, if you're bringing uh, yeah, them in, I don't bring them so in, either. guys. Like, let's see it. Right. Let's let's make yep. the play. And as we are right now, for some reason, the uh, the faithful, because we're just talking about the traditional Numenorians, are both dedicated to the Valar and the heebie-jeebie, whatever, whatever of the of the chances surrounding the ocean. And also, they can yeah. just 
with a bunch of or uh, a bunch of horns blowing at night or all night. Sorry, because they were still blowing yeah. in the morning. You could just summon this monster. Like it just it just hears you from wherever. It's like ah, dude, it's time to do my side gig, which have seems like I haven't been able to do in a little bit. You know, I like to I like to stroll on down to Numenor, eat somebody maybe, and head back up. You know, just a fun little weekend yeah. getaway for this for this <laughs> giant monster. They called it the Sea Worm, which honestly, yeah. good name. Gotta say, they made it look like a dragon too. I was like, ah, nice worms, dragons. Let's bring some more of them yeah. into the show um, <laughs> instead of just keeping naming everything nameless things. Speaking I, of, <laughs> well, well, I will say really, really fast here. So with that plot line, because you're right, if they want to go full Valar and bring the the Silmarillion in again, like do it but they again they i am almost positive i'm like 99 percent sure they don't have the rights to the silmarillion and that they have the exact same rights for the show that peter jackson had I for agree. the movies um at this point because the only gods the only valar that are mentioned are those mentioned in the lord of the rings aule mentioned in the lord of the rings i just looked up manway it has like a footnote in the appendices so that's that's plenty olmo not at all not mentioned once, not that name. So they can't, they don't want to name drop him. They don't want to try it, you know? And so Is everybody, Feanor? even when they named Baron and Tour and Erendil, that stuck out to me the other episode because I know that's exactly who Sam names outside of Shelob's lair. And so, but he doesn't name Turin, son of Hurin. And they, neither did they. Hur, uh, Turin is not mentioned in the Lord of the Rings, I don't think once. And so they didn't mention him either. What about Feanor? Feanor, yes. Um, Gandalf talks about Feanor okay. to Pippin about the Palantiri. Because I, I wonder um, if it's just name dropping or can I you believe. use visual representation? Because we had a statue of what I presume to be Feanor just chilling. Uh, yep. <laughs> yep. Outside Kilimanjaro's spot. <laughs> yeah. It felt a At little weird to me because Gandalf. I feel like Feanor ran out of his goodwill, not – not long into the elves' journey into Middle <laughs> Earth, um, I guess I could see it. Celebrimbor seems to really honor and aspire to be Feanor in a lot of ways, but still, like they're... he's trying to overcome. It. <laughs> and I think that is lore-wise correct. I think he does try to kind of live in his shadow and overcome Feanor. Um, at least, again, Feanor is mentioned in at least a footnote. I I know Gandalf tells Pippin about the Palantir, but I don't know if he mentions Feanor there. But here it is in in a footnote in the Lord of the Rings, like Appendix E, right? Appendix E. So I think that's enough for the show to be like, okay, we can use him. Um, and maybe they were given a couple things from the Silmarillion that they could, like, again, the likeness for the statue, right? Like you're saying, I don't know though, and it's just. That, that does bother me, too, because, again, you're acting like you've got rights to a show that they don't have rights. Like, you, uh, uh, it, why make a Second Age show if you don't have the rights to the Second Age? I just I still don't understand that. But that's that's a two years ago kind of thing. Yeah. Um, however, I will say one last thing on the Numenor plot. Elendil's daughter was such an easy convert. I will also say, like, like again, Anarian, this is, this, from what we've I heard, think, not. I think it's a Sildor. victim of this fast track Numenor plotline because she has a motivation, right? She's like, oh, my mom died. Yeah. Um, and she's like, if, if they lead more into the, how can you say the sea is right, is always right if it literally drowned mom, dad? Um, but she doesn't. She just keeps yeah. saying my mom died. <laughs> and so <Yeah. laughs> she's like, and, you know, I wish we learned a little bit more about her so that we could see, like, you know, maybe there's a, a level amp- of ambition to her that just keeps, you know, getting fed by Farazan, so she's right, able to right. kind more, of you know yeah, explain away her, her, her actions to herself uh instead she's just kind of just been pretty much since season one already uh just always an antagonist um continuing to be now yeah. uh even though she's like sad somewhat a level of sad that her dad is being sentenced to being eaten by a sea monster but you know she's willing to stand yeah. up you know, stick her chin up and get through it. So it's just, it, it really does make her feel like not a real person or even close. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah I think yeah, all that I, is I related agree. to how fast this Numenor plot line is getting thrown at us. It's funny. Some plot, some plot lines feel like they're going super slow. And then that one does, I agree, feel like it's going really fast all of a sudden. Um, and then what, sorry, there was one more thing with this plot line. The Palantir 
I don't think I've mentioned it in the last couple episode reviews, but I meant to. That Palantir thing drives me nuts. That drives me nuts. I did, how it I like, explodes into it. evil. Yeah, I was like, why oh. is the Palantir evil right now? Like, <laughs> I wish we, even, here's how you fix it. You just have a scene where Anatar is gazing into one. That's it. That's how you fix it. That he's new, that he's manipulating Numenor from Eregion. And maybe he probably already is. But the thing is, obviously the Palantiri were not corrupted at this point in the books. And again, that's fine if we want to change it, but be, but change it then. Like be uh, true to that change. Stand Stand with it. Stand on business. Because if you're going to change it and then act like it, I don't know. Why is the Palantir just like blowing up and showing these visions to our Farazhan? I'm actually I mean, fine with it. I being, can see it tr- instead of being evil, just being kind of scary to use. And so that's why he keeps like making Muriel like ready to just give up in order to uh, allegedly save her, her home. But sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know. The whole thing about the plant here right now feels like a sideshow uh, that is also not given enough time, but also is taking yeah. time away from other like more pressing stuff in the Numenor plot line. I really want to see. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. Know. It's, it's totally fair. And it, it keeps showing us the same t- sort of Palantir vision without showing us more context of what's actually going on. And the thing is, is they keep treating Numenorians like basic humans. They were not, they were supermen. They were like Captain America's, just all of them, right? They were these giants. They were smart. They were powerful. And they were wise enough to, ha- even even the evil ones, even the Kingsmen, they, they should be able to use the Palantir because the Palantir came from like, came from Numenor on Elendil's ships and from Numenor they came from Beleriand and, and the elves of Fanor. Like, they they are not normal people. <laughs> and so, that again, that's fine if we want to use, have Sauron maybe having s- stolen one. But, Roy, did he steal one in, in season one now that I'm ranting about it? Did, did we see Anatar steal one or uh, Halbrand? I, one of the Palantir? I honestly don't remember. Like, I don't think so. I don't so. think so. I don't think he has a, a Palantir. I honestly don't think Sauron in the show is thinking about Numenor in this moment. And that's part of the problem, right? Is that we've, we've established that Anatar, the show has shown us Anatar is an excellent manipulator uh, mm-hmm. right now. <laughs> Last season? Yeah. <laughs> eh, not really. Uh, like the first episode of this season, which every time I, every, every with, with, as we get further on in the season, I hate the opening to episode one more and more. Um, Same. Of like loser, loser Sauron, who's just yeah. being down in the dumps after getting like dumped by a dar at prom. Uh, <laughs> like <laughs> it, so many problems in this show could be solved. If we were watching Sauron at that point, instead of just being a loser, actually start to put in some of the machinations that lead us mm-hmm. to this moment uh, where everything is going wrong for everybody. Instead, everything is going wrong for everybody. And, Anatar is just the one who's like, wait, somebody's got to make money off this. I guess it's going to be me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready to move away from the Numenor for now. Uh, yeah. And I, what I'll say too to just wrap that up, that was one of the better plot lines in, in this episode, in my opinion. Yeah, I've got so. <laughs> four more plot lines to complain about, or three more plot lines to complain about. So. So let's move. Let let's save the largest one that we have for for actually last. If if we could that depends here, depends if we have the same um, one. Oh, we have the same one. Are you sure? Are you <laughs> I sure? have no doubt. Are you sure? <laughs> I, I'm gonna complain about the built-in bathroom break. Uh, See, that's the, the thing. Harfoots. That's the thing. The Harfoots are not. They're not for er, me. I I I group the wander uh, the stranger. Okay, I group right, Gandalf right, and the right, Hobbits then together. Never mind, we do it. So. <laughs> The East, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. I grouped those two together. Let's talk about so. Adar next, all right? I imagine all right, that Adar, you and I have similar yes. thoughts on this. So, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. we. Uh, my problem with Adar, he, I am exactly 50-50 on this guy, on, the, on this plot even being a thing. Because I think having Adar in that whole plot line adds such a problem that the show didn't need to add that it added to itself. So like the whole, again, orcs being good. We hammered that away. However, 
If they had switched it to Adar is a corrupted elf, but so are all the others, or they're all dark elves that are being manipulated by like, or have been manipulated by Sauron and Morgoth in the East, and then the dark elves of the East who never went to Beleriand, never went to um, Valinor, that they're the ones in this faction rather than orcs. I feel like that would make much more sense to me versus like Galadriel being maybe okay with working with the orcs teaming up against Sauron. That just seems so weird to me based on how Tolkien wrote the orcs and based on how all of that kind of worked. So Adar is to me a giant problem. And so again, partially corrupted elves or dark elves or something, even Easterlings actually would have been a lot better. Even like Easterlings or Haradrim in my mind, uh, you could have done nearly the same sort of plot line, but without having this dilemma of like, Orcs are good, and Sauron's literally the only thing that's bad. Ugh. So, yeah, Roy, what, what, what do you think about Adar? I don't even think that's the biggest problem with what's going on screen right now, Yoyce. I gotta be real with you. Um, like, first of all, Galadriel is the least likable character in this show. And I think the show <laughs> is so trying so hard to both tell us that she's great and show us none of it. Because I want yeah. to like her. I like Morfid Clark, the actor. I do know one of the yeah. names. I like her. I think she's doing go. a good job. <laughs> I like the concept of a Galadriel that they throw out. This young, rash, but incredibly skilled Galadriel. You know what the problem is? She has no skills mm. right now. All she does is get beat, <laughs> and all she does is get tricked, and then all she does is care about killing Sauron. But only sometimes. That she, it's, yeah. It makes no sense to me where... Yep. You know, in the fir- in the in the beginning of the show, she was like, "We need to get Sauron because they are a threat to all elven kind." And also, I got personal beef, but they are a threat to all <laughs> elven kind. In this episode, it's like, what's more important to me? In the last scene, it's like, is is it is it that Adar just said that he's invading Eregion and killing all these innocent elves, or is it that I think Sauron's right? I think Sauron is 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 getting us right now. That's what's that's what I'm mad about. It's it's not like Adar. Don't yeah. do this. It's like Adar. Don't don't do this because I think Sauron wants you to. It's like why is that the part that you care about right now? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, Adar <laughs> is the War of Elves and Sauron. Bro, toss that. All right. It's War of Adar and Sauron. Like that's all this yeah. is. It's like the elves are. I cannot believe in a show about the Second Age about the Rings of Power. We have made elven kind side casualties in this conflict. Yes. What? Yes. <laughs> I think, yeah, see, I think that's what I mean of like, if these guys were dark elves, if they were even something else, like even if, I don't know, I th- I think the Lindon, uh, Gilgalad plotline and stuff has a lot of its own problems in that they're just not present enough and that Gilgalad's also the second least likable character in the show. It's true. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> But yeah, no, entirely. The fact that there's so much emphasis put, and again, we all, part of the problem that I have with the show at large is that a lot of it is predictable. And one of those things is I already know Adar will die by Sauron's hands or or be corrupted by him to serve him. And Sauron will use probably the one ring to dominate all of the orcs on, in his following and create his orc army. And that's like how it'll go. It's like we're setting up the, oh, these poor orcs. Who's who's ever going to let them live in their own land? Oh, but Sauron's going to corrupt them all. No, they were already corrupted. They already followed Sauron in the first age under Morgoth. We know this. Adar even says part of that. He's like, yeah, we like followed him too. Adar and, was like, bro, and I then, was there. Like- <laughs> I was there. We and then the whole Morgoth's crown thing, oh, and then the whole like three elven rings plus Morgoth's crown should be enough to kill Sauron. I'm like, bro, where are you getting this from? What, yeah, like, what where, information like, in the, are in the you lore. pulling out of right now? Forget in the lore. Yeah, what's he pulling? Or, sorry, out? I mean in in this in yeah, the in, show in the book or in, <laughs> sorry in the show. Yeah, like in the show, where are you getting this from? And in the in the lore within the show is what I was trying to say. It's like in the lore within the show. Where is that coming from? Where is it said that Sauron, oh, like the anti-Sauron an, uh, antidote is three elven rings plus Morgoth crown equal dead Sauron. Especially because- What? How does Adar know about the elven rings 
at all. How much time has passed since the Elven Rings were made? True. It's, he's like, I hear that they've they, they've like healed your people. I was like, how did you know that her people were dying in the first place? Like, yes. how do you know any of these things? You've been, you've that's, been capturing that's a great elves. Point, you've been like, like he, the only elf that was near Mordor was Orondir. And he, you know, I know, I know he didn't tell you because he's not even a part of this plot line for some reason. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he is kept very far away. And again, somehow he figured out how Hal- Sauron, isn't he? It's like, oh yeah, he is. I, uh, I, I don't really know how he put that together. <laughs> it's, I, it's just because, of the, like that, that, that I could see him putting together because it's like, oh man, dude, Galadriel is so angry about something. Looks like she got tricked by that random dude she was mm. with. Um, but <laughs> what's true. what's more true. crazy to me is he's just he just knows everything. He's like I. And what about the elves' invasion of Mordor? It's like, oh, you just... Oh, yeah! How did he know about that? <laughs> it's like, yeah, you, you, right. You just, got, you just got eyes in the sky right now? And if you do, maybe that would explain why you suddenly have a million orcs. <laughs> At Aragian, where you know Sauron is, because not only are you trusting Halbrand, but you also know Halbrand is Sauron, and, and that you're trusting he is going to Aragian. <laughs> like, you're trusting that he actually went where he said he's going to go. This guy who you Funny. keep telling everyone <laughs> is a liar and a manipulator. You are like just yeah. taken at face value. And, oh, dude, it's so annoying. Um, yeah, and 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 again, like we, uh, I hate to keep ha- like ha- harping on this, but the orcs' morality issue. They're like, let's kill the elves anyway, and we'll just get Sauron too. And Galadriel's like, no, don't do that. She didn't okay, even say, like, no, don't do that. Okay, let's be clear about this. She was just like, uh, she was screaming she was, about something. She was like, this is Sauron's plan. This is what he wants. It's like, that, yeah, at no yeah. point did she say, no, the elves, my kind, those innocent people. <laughs> at no point was she's like, well, let's try to, you know. So I was giving her too much credit. Yeah. Oh, dude. Irigian uh, is also, but- Irigian, like, Celebrimbor is just the only person that keeps this place afloat. Uh, you know, that's the implication because when he's yeah. tied up at the lab, uh, everything else is just doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all the guards Dude. just like, man, bro, we sent out a bunch of guards and they all died except for this one. That's weird. Should we do anything about I'm, it? Uh, I don't know yet. Let's, let's try to talk to the boss, I guess. And <laughs> <laughs> he is the micromanager and the overall manager, and yeah, that. And then he's he's locked up. He's he's tied away, and and, this, and that's why they're all like, "Wait, Anatar, you're calling the shots now?" But also, he, he gave up the season. They're like, <laughs> the is the is." It was Elrond who's supposed to be the smart elf. Who's like, "Oh, did." Eregion is the crown jewel. Clearly not, because they're getting got right now, and they're not even trying to <laughs> defend themselves yet. Yeah. Everyone's just running around screaming in the streets. Like, dude, how did all? How did like a hundred thousand orcs spawn, like, and then walk their way there, presumably without any sign of warning, until just a random like elf shows up dead? carved into if the elf disappeared like in if they didn't send the message back i guarantee you the irigian elves would just be like man dude it's so weird that like a whole squad of elves disappeared anyways uh what are you doing for dinner tonight <laughs> <laughs> uh there are plot holes in Ariador near Oregian, near the Barrow Downs, all this stuff that I still don't get. See, I forgot and it comes back the, to one. I forgot about the Barrow Downs. But they just <laughs> threw that in there for nothing. <laughs> oh, yeah. And and this is what, honestly, one of my overall problems of Season 2 is. And it actually has to do with one of the best parts of Season 2, Sauron. His abilities, like, unclear Sauron abilities are unclear. I He's powerful enough to all of a sudden cause this, like, tremor in the earth and do all this weird stuff that, like, made Elrond and Galadriel have to walk around it. He's so powerful to create this whole illusion, but at the same time, he might get got by Adar again because he did in episode one. It's like, it's so weird. I'm not saying we need like a definite power scale, but I would say before the end of the season, we should know how powerful Sauron is. If maybe all this, his quote unquote death and all of this was a trick of some kind, I don't know how that could happen, but um, if if he's just been the mastermind about literally everything, including Adar killing him that first time, I I don't know how they would do it, but that would make Sauron a lot better than he is right now because his abilities are so unclear. A, co- he's a couple so episodes ago, so ago I was like, maybe this is the plan, but then I poked like nine holes in it. So uh, mm-hmm. 
I guess like yeah. if you want, I, I just, they, I don't think they got this. I don't think they, I think there's too many holes in the ship for that kind of thing to sail. And because it can't, dude, I just don't know what they're trying to do. I don't understand yeah. it. Um, but yeah, that was my, yeah. I guess, second most annoying plot line. If we're combining Harfoots and Stranger, I, which I don't think yeah, we should. I, will I think say they since- are two, they're on two completely different levels of awful. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll get there in a second. But I will say, since we're talking about Sauron and Aragian too, I think it's very clear to every other elf like that this Anatar guy is like manipulating Celebrimbor. I feel like that also went a bit fast, where he was like, "We will not make rings for men," and now he's like, "I can't, I can't do any. I literally can't sleep until I get these rings done for men." And it's like, what happened? What happened from last episode to this episode, where now all of a sudden Celebrimbor is that obsessed? It's it's a fast fast transition. Um, and again, I don't know Sauron's power. It, it is kind of weird still having the nine rings be the last, as in like the most perfected of the rings of power. Yet they're also the most going to be the most corrupted. I, I think that's why. It's kind of a strange. I think that's the idea. Um, and I actually I don't yeah. hate this change necessarily. There's a level of scale. There's a little bit of build up to it, right? We made three rings first, and Sauron, you know, could not get the same corruption, and he wasn't as involved with it. He was still kind of getting on. Like, how is this going to work? Then he got seven, yeah. and he got his fingers in him a little bit more. Now we're scaling up the business. We're going to nine, and Sauron's all over this one. He's like, these are going to be the ones, yeah. uh, and I am going to just take over mankind with them. Um, <laughs> I think there's al- yes. there's also a level. It's like you know he wants the most amount of rings that he has the influence of out in the world. Uh, I think I I, 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 could, I could see it. You know, I could see the vision. I can see where it's going. How's the one ring yeah. going to come into this? Great question. Not really sure yet. Because uh, that's supposed yeah, to be forged I, at Mount Doom. Uh, and right after all the rings of power are also forged. So so he's trying to leash them all. But also, but again, like, he, know, he knows that the elven rings exist. And he he's not been able to touch the any of the rings yet. So we're not that far from the lore in that. But he does know they exist prior to the one ring being built, which is very different from the lore. What, what I don't understand is how they're going to get Sauron out. Like I could see a hundred ways where he takes over Adar's army during this sack mm-hmm. of Aregion and Adar's like, Oh no, the most predictable thing that yeah. could have happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could, but what, the, what I don't understand is how Sauron is going to get out without the orcs to then get back to Mount Dune, make the one ring and then take over the orcs. Like, I don't see how that's going to happen. Sure. Unless we get oh, some more teleportation fair. going on, which to be fair, we've seen a ton of with these elven plot lines. Like people just be, do you think they would go as far? <laughs> yeah, that is, it's true. Do you think they would go as far as to have Sauron make the one ring, not at Mount Doom, but in a I mean, at this point, if they do, I just don't understand what the play is like. That this is the whole plot. Like there, 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 there's like you know, kind of tossing the 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 lore of you know the Silmarillion and the appendices out the window to try to make something work, and then there's then there's tossing out like the entire premise of the Lord of the Rings out. Like that's literally the sure. plot. Is man, we can't destroy yep. these anywhere, but where they were made, Mount Doom. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I don't think they would do that, but I I would say that would be a huge issue if they did. Because you're right. Like Maybe he doesn't capture the orcs here and now. Maybe he does just escape, get back to, to Mount Doom, make the ring, and then, then he's got all the orcs in And Middle if he Earth does escape control. without controlling the orcs, you're telling me that the War of Elves and Sauron didn't even have Sauron involved? Like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yeah, that is a good point. Um, I'm curious... So it looks like maybe a Rondir is going to bring, he's going to teleport here pretty soon to Aragian with his people. He'll probably be like the his people, part of the bro, force. We didn't even with, see his people this episode. It was just him. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. He teleports himself. And honestly, he's an army. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out if maybe he would be a part of like Elrond's backup force. That's going to be coming next episode. I, I don't, I, I don't know how Arondir really plays into the larger plot. You don't know how um, Arondir like, okay, crazy. Okay. I'm about to I'm about to toss out an idea that could make Rob great. All right, okay. Tell me this one. All right, cut Galadriel, the character of Galadriel that we know that we've seen thus far. Yeah. Have that just be a Sauron plot, uh, right? Where he mm-hmm. he goes to Numenor, 
you know, he does all these things and then he goes and we just kind of cut out all of Galadriel just kind of bumbling down the road. You're going to have to change some stuff with how the rings work with the elves and stuff like that. But sure. you also have Elrond in a lot of the same spots once you get to Eregion. So you, I think I think you can make it work. And then, it, yeah. like, take that Galadriel character, make them a Rondir. And suddenly Galadriel is the coolest character in the show like you wanted to be in the first part. Like <laughs> she yeah. cares about these people. She's fighting against Sauron the whole time. She's both <laughs> likable and skilled. Dude, I don't want yeah. now. Listen, <laughs> I don't want that now. I'm still because I love Aron yeah. here. I've I've grown attached sure. to him, but I yeah, don't understand how everything that they say they want Galadriel to do, they don't let her do, but also let Aron do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, she had like one good fight scene this whole season so far, and then she got. And captured, I'm sure she'll remember? have another one. <laughs> yep, yep. At the end, I'm sure she'll have another one. Probably next episode of her escape or something. But you're right. You're. T- I still think it shouldn't have even been Galadriel. I think it should have been Calabrian, to be entirely honest, because of the romance they're building between her and Elrond. Like, I think it should have been Calabrian this whole yeah, time. Yeah, that's like a whole. But it's a whole other animal right now, my man. Yeah, we gotta have because Cal- they could have done much have more for that. Whatever they wanted. He's not allowed in these premises. So <laughs> <laughs> true, true. You ready to talk about um, Harfoots? Let's go dwarves really fast. Oh, shit, I uh, about dwarves. Uh, and then and then we're on to it. Okay. Uh, My beef with so, dwarves I mean, is that I feel like honestly I don't have a lot of com- I don't have a lot of complaints about the dwarf line. I think that King Durin the yeah. Third has gone super evil very quick. Um, yes. Yep. We kind of. I think last episode was peak. This dwarf has got has the the ring has clearly made him greedy, but not greedy enough yeah. to collapse the dwarven rule like Sauron wanted. I think he's now f- yep. fallen on the other side of that cliff a little bit. Um, oh, for sure. I don't. I I I guess I don't hate. Disa and during the fourth, like teaming up to try to resist the father as an idea or as a plot line. What I am curious about is what's the point if, you yes, know, suddenly Sauron actually has a bunch of mithril, which is something I have a lot. It's like, is this, is this fake mithril? Is this like special Sauron corruption material that he's, that he's like, dressing up to look like mithril or did he just straight up you know thieve this from from the horde of the dwarves when he was there because they said yeah. no they were like nah dude get out of here <laughs> yep get out which was which was cool like, i thought that was a good scene have that. i enjoyed that yeah and i thought that was I, and i liked the part yeah. after it where during uh where young younger Duran was like yo i can't believe like dude for a second there, I thought you were just going to try to, like, <laughs> you were crazy. sell him. And he's like, oh, I am. Yeah. But for the right price. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For, for more money. <laughs> um, I will say I agree. The the contrived pot, part of the Dwarven plot is certainly contrived. I think some of the family drama, it makes sense when the ring got involved. But I honestly think it would have been better to have, during the Elder and during the Younger, have a good relationship first. And then you yes. see the ring drive them apart. Yes. And then it's like, oh, yes, crap, we see how, how bad this is. And it is kind of funny that he's like the only one, him and Disa, that see how bad his father's gotten like that fast. He's, they're the only ones in like the whole kingdom that are like, Narvi kind of sees it a little bit, but not enough to actually you know do anything about it, but I guess. also, you've now run it, out of Dame Dwarves in the show, so... True. Who, who else? Who else do you want? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say, say the Disa thing with her calling in the bats again. I'm not exactly sure what the what the point of all this is yet. It's kind of kind of made me cringe. It's just like they came across her. Is this meant to frighten us? No, it's meant to make us cringe. Like that, that was a little. Call, that was uh, like a. That was like a. Uh, uh, an MCU cringy kind of esque line yeah. where it's like, no, they yeah. are like. I actually kind of. There's a, there's a level of me that can find a way to dig it, right? Like, Disa is supposed to be, like, a mountain singer. She's supposed to be in tune with the yeah. system, not just the rock, but also, like, the environment, the region, the ecosystem that is the mountain. So having, you know, an idea of how to, like, mani- or not really, like, I guess it is manipulating, uh, manipulating uh, a bunch of wild creatures that live in the mountain there, like, I could... 
you know, I could see that if we had literally mm-hmm. in any indication up to this point that that was something that they even <laughs> cared about. Instead of what yeah. we have right now, which do. is Disa suddenly summoning bats and everyone just being like, whoa. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I agree. It's it, maybe there wasn't enough context to these scenes. Again, things moving too fast, but it also a little I, I, really fast before we get to it. I will say uh, Duran's acting during the younger's acting was super good in that scene. Yes. And we're just thinking about his father and stuff. You could just see it on his face. Um, but some plot lines are going too fast and then some are far too slow. Let's go over to the Harfoots. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the Harfoots, the Harfoots, the Harfoots. All right. So there was only like one scene of Harfooting. All right. Mm-hmm. And still it was bad. Still it was a tank. Yeah. It was a tank job. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. just to start with, all right, the least thing, the thing that's least annoying to me is how we had two episodes ago, right? We had two Harfoots meet a steward. And one of those, Rosie, um, that's her name, right? <laughs> uh, oh no, I don't even remember. What's her name? Because <laughs> of power, Harfoot names. <laughs> oh, that's bad. I don't even remember Poppy. the character's Not name. Rosie uh, Poppy. It's another flower. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, that's rough. So Poppy. All right. We we kind of memed it at the start when they just brought Poppy back into the show. Like psych, that whole emotional goodbye scene. Um, we we yeah. forgot that we needed a character for this, like, so <laughs> we're bringing her back. And now yeah. they're doing another stupid thing where they just push this Poppy character. We just met this this store. They had like two lines together, and then they followed this guy around. And now the next episode, they're making out in the middle of town. Yeah, like. What? Nuts. What's going uh, on, dude? Like, have we forgotten shame? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, I just don't understand how <laughs> these characters that presumably, at least, definitely uh, nobody, like, pres- <laughs> have never had a romantic experience before, are suddenly yeah. very cool with uh, chewing fish in broad daylight in the middle of town with everybody watching and you know they're watching because they lead up into that scene <laughs> is and, them and like, being watched <laughs> usually i don't get after something like this because you're t- entirely right but like in the in the lord of the rings movies when's the first time that we see sam and rosie kiss the end <laughs> the wedding their wedding and then the end and i'm like like there's there's a little bit of that like shy hobbit like very very nice, sweet, almost innocent kind of love. It, it, you know, where maybe they'll, maybe Sam would go on like a many dates with her before he would even attempt to kiss her kind of thing. And it's like, now all of a sudden, yeah, broad daylight, <laughs> middle of town. She rolls in, boom, boy, instant boyfriend. And you already know, they're out of here. <laughs> they are out and they're not taking that guy with them. I am like almost certain of it. Like, Maybe, 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 maybe we, this is how we get our, our number three. Or if that's Frodo and, and Sam at this point, these these two ha- uh, Harfoots, maybe this is our, our Pippin, I guess. But Dude, I, <laughs> maybe they roll out together. I highly doubt it. They're out of here. That's the thing, right? It's like, I, I want to be clear. I'm not complaining that these two characters kissed on screen in any way. I have no problem with that. That's fine. What I have a problem with is that they expect me to care about it. <laughs> and I really don't. <laughs> yeah, I, but I'll I'll just even say with Hobbit culture, it's it's a little bit more shy than that, and it's a little bit more. I don't know if shy um, is the right word with Hobbit culture. I kind of see what you're going for, but also these these are the people that get wasted in the bar like every night. <laughs> There's no way. There's no way. Uh, like let's let's be so real right now. But reg- re- back to the actual meat of the matter. It's we have a character that they are that they want us to care about in nobody. They have a character mm-hmm. that they assume that we care about in Poppy, and that's a bold assumption <laughs> with how much you know this 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 plotline has dragged like a chain. Uh, oh. <laughs> and they're trying to make yeah. nobody make us care more about nobody by forcing a romance. <laughs> With Bobby, I literally forgot that was his name, dude. Nobody. I oh my really gosh. don't care. I I could not like, yeah. care less about this romance. That's what I have written in my notes. 
But that's not even the most annoying part in the scene. Because Nori's conversation with the head honcho Mm -hmm. is just, what? Literally, last conversation they had was like, are you supposed to be the one that leads us out of here? This conversation, no, there's nowhere we could go. This is our home. We'll fight and die in it. Uh. (laughs) Like... What what's, uh. <laughs> what is the what is the plot? What is the lore? What are you trying to tell us with this? And why do you assume I care? Because I and just I, don't. I, <laughs> it's funny because I think they're trying to do. And people, yes, people do complain that one of the slower parts of all three movies is Pippin and Mary and Treebeard. But it always connects back to the main plot very like quickly. Maybe they'll spend an extended edition scene talking about what happened to the ant wives and like exploring that but it comes back to the evils of of like sauron and so forth well we're not sure where they went no one cares for the trees anymore and and they're gone now and it's like that plants a seed for then when you know treebeard sees in the movies sees all of the destroyed trees and ants he's like this is like, you know, kind of what happened to the Empire. Like, I was just talking let's about Let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's go to war. And that, I think, is what's... Mi- I think that's what they're trying to do half of with the Harfoot plot, is it's like, let's expand the lore. Oh, I buried my poor husband beneath this tree. Okay, who killed him? Like, Sauron's forces? Like, how are we going to tie this back to the main plot? Was it... Uh, oh, there is no connection? It's just some lore no, dude, that wanna, is not from the They just want to care about this character whose name I don't remember... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the matriarch lady. Yeah, what's her name? Um, I don't know. I I literally don't know, and I and I don't I'm think gonna I'm going to need to because I think she's dead <laughs> yeah. next episode. But you know, yeah, is it was it the Easterlings in the Haradrim under the command of yeah Sauron and so Black forth? Wizard? That, yeah, like if it was the Black Wizard, like let's let's tie let's tie these plot lines together. Right now, it's back just, together. It's just Harfoot's being sad, or sorry, it's Stores being sad, Harfoot's be, feeling yep. guilty, and not a th- not anything else happening. Like. This yeah. plotline drags again, again, so like, hard. So, so much. And the Pippin and Mary plotline becomes hype by the end of Two Towers. Because even though in some, it's like, we've been sitting here for days and you just finished saying hello or good morning or whatever. Um, and, and then it ties back. It's, you know, we're not going to go to war. And then obviously they go to war. Um, it, it ties back. And it's very clear what the halflings are trying to do. Why seek out the stores? What would the stores do for the halfling or the, the Harfoots? Literally no idea. They're just bumbling around. And uh, the only one that might be able to save the day is Luke Skywalker and Yoda. Sorry, I mean uh, The Stranger and Tom Bombadil. Uh, because that was definitely the Dagobah scene from oh Empire Strikes Back. Okay. Where it was like, if you go now, and you won't complete your training. That's exactly what they want. <sighs> okay, so let's talk. I, I, I am going to... I'm going to I'm going to complain about Tom Bombadil like as <laughs> yep. a character. But first, let's just talk about just the plot of this, okay? So, the premise is that the stranger who's totally not Gandalf by the way, but he keeps getting fed Gandalf lines. Um mm-hmm. is Yeah, he's plagiarizing Gandalf straight up. <laughs> is is he is the one who's going to save everybody. But before he could do that, he needs to get a staff. All right? So here's the thing about Lord of the Rings. There are some inherently magic items. But all of the cool items that you know are not cool because they are magic. They are cool because of deeds that they did. All right? All these named swords from The Hobbit, the Foe Hammer. Gandalf immediately is like, oh, off the rip. Here's the story. That's why it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Not because it's an elf sword. Yeah. It's literally just a cool elf sword. But that dude that I know, he wielded it, and it was super cool, Bilbo. So, you know, <laughs> be impressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bilbo is impressed. Totally right. He's like, well, I'll name mine Sting, and I guess I'll try to give it a story of my own. And then he dies. All right? Yep. And nope, there are no, like... There's no magic artifact in Lord of the Rings, greater lore, that does not have a story. Except, I guess, these staffs that are just, like, random throwaway tools because he found one at a (laughs) water well and then immediately broke it. (laughs) It's literally like the – you're right. I mean, you're totally right. It's literally like finding a stick in the forest, Uh, that whole meme of, like, I'm a wizard now. (laughs) 
<laughs> and so he brings him to just a bunch of dead trees. And he's like, you'll find your staff in there. I'm like, who's in charge of this? Like, are these staffs sentient? What's going on? Oh, my gosh. I, yeah. hate, the, I hate the concept of this plot so much. Yeah. If, if, if you wanted to have a scene where there was a, you know, wise character that would teach a fledgling wizard how to be a wizard then do that yep. don't have a scene where the only thing they do is be like i'll help you find a cool stick <laughs> and then you'll yeah. be a cool <laughs> wizard like but but I, fir- I first got a lecture to you line for line your own future lines about what it means to to have pity and all this kind of stuff <laughs> and yet the character and the character that they've chosen the, the the first ballot on who is going to be the one to teach Gandalf how to be a wizard? Mm-hmm. Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil. <laughs> who got, shouldn't I've care got, about I've anything? I've got Tom Bombadil ta- like giving lectures on destiny. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh Tom my Bombadil gosh! Yes, there is a place in the lore. There's yeah. a place in this story even to show a tom bombadil character to remind the the audience and the characters that what they're fighting for may feel like you know ah the entire world is going to end but then tom bombadil sister and reminds you like listen but life happens what you're doing it's gonna be okay. what you're doing is important yeah. i'm not i'm not arguing with you but like yeah just feel the wind on your cheeks, you know? Like, give it a skip. I, yeah. Let out a song. That's Tom Bombadil. I, not Ryan, you're exactly, whatever I'm yeah, looking you're at exactly right, right. <laughs> There is literally a moment in this season where he could have popped up, and that was when the elves were getting absolutely beaten down by the Barrow Whites. And then, boom, Master of the Forest, who is actually next to the Barrow Downs, shows up and helps them like he does with Frodo. No, instead, like, that's actually... <laughs> calling back and forth, I suppose. Like, it's still maybe not perfect, but it's better than them randomly being like, we found good weapons. Cool. <laughs> Let's get them. I just... Oh. I hate so much. Yeah. Why is Tom Bombadil oh, on the show? Because enough people on the internet said that I wish Tom Bombadil was Lord of the Rings, that some exec was like, listen, man, we gotta have Tom Bombadil on the mm-hmm. show. And they're like, but but boss, he doesn't fit. And they're like, make him fit. What's going Make on? Make him fit. <laughs> Make him fit with Gandalf. Also, um, well, and- Gandalf's personality is very, he's sassy, but he's also incredibly yeah. serious. He's a very serious yep. character. So is Tom. So is Tom. No! Yeah. <laughs> what? No, dude, I, I'll i argue that. I'll argue Tom is, well, so is Tom in the, uh, sorry, I'm talking in the show. They're yeah, both no, like I'm talking about the brooding lore. I'm serious. I'm talking about the right now. <laughs> I was like, what oh, are you oh, yeah, about? no, no, you're good. In, in the show, they are the stranger and or Gandalf, right? We know it's Gandalf and Tom in the show, insanely serious. Why? <laughs> no idea. Also, no the, idea. The implication here is that, and I, I get it, right? This, this is a different Tom Bombadil. You know, I part of me understands that they want me to let go of the Palm Dom. Tom Bombadil of my past, but I say change the name if you're not going to do it. <laughs> yes. Regardless, yes, the Tom Bombadil I know, right? The Tom Bombadil, mm-hmm. the 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 go lucky free, he grates on Gandalf, and you're telling me that this is the one who's feeding Gandalf lines? He's the one. Yeah. Who's- yep. <laughs> like what? I, are no, you and, and then about? that's. <laughs> The, the feeding the lines bit actually really bothers me and not even just from a lore perspective because that's a different issue, but from a realism perspective. Ryan, 10 years ago, right now, we were in some of the same high school classes together. Could you no recall way. word There's for no word way. what one of our teachers said from high school? There's like no a whole way. monologue. There is no way. Like I'm literally a teacher now and I think back and I can't do that. <laughs> I can't even remember what I said the last period of the class that I'm teaching again the next period. Period and being like, man, I said that really well that time. How did I? How did I say that? But no, Gandalf's like exactly word for word quoting Tom Bombadil. Or we have lazy writers, <laughs> and we've got lazy writers in oh, in Rings of Power. Dude, I and so yeah. I mean, let's be real. I started this ep, uh, this review with you saying this is a well made tech, like technically well made show. But the thing that makes this show not good and will continue to make it 
in my mind, overall, less than less than par, less than average. And in my mind, overall, not worth watching for the regular person. Overall, I kind of wish it maybe would get canceled so we got something better in the future, uh, is the writing. It's the story. It's how they use and abuse the characters. I absolutely detest that from both a lore perspective and from like a common sense perspective. Because again, anyone listening right now, <laughs> an hour and four minutes in, <laughs> we appreciate it. But <laughs> think back to when you were in school, how many ever years ago, could you exactly recall some monologue one of your teachers gave? There's no way. But Gandalf's doing this not only 10 years later, 15, 20 years later, he's doing this thousands of years later he's like tom bombada once told me all buh, 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 buh. i memorized it while i was wandering middle earth i guess well, i was I, dehydrated like, and scared and afraid of my afraid for my friends in the desert this is what i latched yep. on to that moment <laughs> oh dude it's so yep. so annoying and i just they cannot make me care about this this evil <laughs> wizard if they refuse to show him on screen do anything wrong all he's done on screen is tell them, like, tell some, 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 like, Easterlings, I guess. I guess we don't really know exactly what they are. Uh, bring those hobbits to me so that we can get the Istari. That's it. Yep. That's all he's done. He did some cool magic with some moths, I guess. Um, speaking of, I did, I did note this in the back. How come Sauron gets to have the cool, soft, like, you know, interesting magic that like makes you think like, oh, that's so cool. Where everyone else just has the <laughs> blasting in the face magic. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. I, I mean, maybe you brought up the MCU earlier of like that one line. It's kind of how the MCU is like Loki has the illusionary magic and then everybody else is just blowing stuff up pretty much. And just doesn't doing matter who crazy you things. are. Like if you've got magic, you're yep. just, you're just throwing fireballs, I guess. Uh, or <laughs> in this show, like, tornadoes of wind that you can't control that also just throw can't people with a stick miles yeah. and don't kill them. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so I kind of, as we come to, to wrapping it all up, I'll say like overall, this episode suffers from many of the same bad things and it reemphasizes a lot of the same good things. I would, I would score this right. Roy, I really like that. You've said, kind of set the bar if it's beneath five out of 10, it's just not worth your time even. So I've really been thinking more about, about that as kind of a metric, I would say overall, if for whatever reason, the Hobbit, the Harfoot plotline just poof, vanished, was not there, then we're in the positives. But because that actually is there and detracts, it, it takes away from the experience. I literally think, even though it wouldn't make sense for them to do it and would hurt them in a different way, I think just dropping that plot line from the show entirely and never mentioning it again would actually be better for the show at this argue, point. Than oh, tr- you trying never to, dro- like never dropping it again. I don't, I don't even know I, I might argue with you that with that. I think that if they just wrapped it where it's like, oh, and then everyone died in the desert. Uh oh. Like that would <laughs> and then be that, more, and then Gandalf that would be more interesting. Because it's like, oh, sure. there is a super bad, powerful thing that's going on in the oh, east that we yeah. no longer have a way of keeping tabs on. Like that adds stress to the show. Like that's that fair. would be more yeah, that's a good, worthwhile that's a good point. than I actually think these plot lines are adding. <laughs> It's true. If especially what that if they do have the stranger as Gandalf and they do, it, him emerging from the east and maybe going west and actually interacting now with these plot lines of uh, how they're going to introduce him is beyond me to to our western characters, but they they have to figure that one out. Uh, but yeah, if we have the Harfoots and stuff like there's they come to a rough end, it'd be hard to watch for sure or whatever, but like that would be that would actually be interesting cuz it's like that's why Gandalf maybe cares so much about the hobbits and he's got like he's got a little bit of darkness that he's seen and and some trauma that he's had. That yeah, that's fair. I was more thinking like Bran uh season 5 of Game of Thrones where they're just like, "No, nope. <laughs> not going to show him once." We don't need him. Like I <laughs> yeah, we don't even need him. <laughs> um yeah, no, that's fair. I think that would actually add to the experience. So, um but any t- with that in mind, with that being there, like my original score for this episode was actually a six out of 10, but the more we talk, that six out of 10 would be reserved for the episode in which the Harfoots weren't shown and which Gan- or the Gandalf wasn't shown. And the rest of the episode, that would have been a six out of 10 in my mind, but the Tom Bombadil slaughtering, like the, the just the absolute destruction of that character, uh, the Gandalf stuff, the Harfoot stuff, it drops it because it's just so not necessary that like, it it takes the problems that I have with every other plot line and it just far exceeds those problems. So for me, with this episode, I'm at a four out of ten, I think. It's close to a five out of no, ten, but I'm, I think it's I'm four with out of you 10. on that. I mean, like I said, it I 
it really is hard for me to give anything like a three out of ten or lower. Like it's it's re- it's yeah. got to be truly insulting to my time. Yeah, a five out of ten, I would come out and I'd go like, man, I'd be I'd be wondering like if I had just been doing something else, like would have that been a better use of my time? But no, I do think a four is is a fair score right now. And what kills me is that there is good things. There are good things happening, even if. Yeah. Even even with all the all the stuff, there's some moments of writing. There's some like, there's some storylines. There's some characters. There's some really talented actors that, in a show where they were not shackled by as much stuff as they are, this would be a quality experience. I could enjoy it. I'd be really happy about it. If imagine how good the Numenor plotline could be if you took all the time. Which granted, honestly, hasn't been that much time. All the time and effort dedicated towards the Harfoot and Stranger plot lines and just gave that screen time back to Numenor to like really get in there and cook. Yeah. Uh, yep. yeah. But that's the thing, is that right. I, I was realizing today it's not that the Harfoot plot line takes a long time to be told. It's that it's a short but feels long experience. This ro- this that romance doesn't need to be told. between Poppy yeah. and nobody has like maybe six minutes of on-screen showing before they're making out like yep that's all that we've gotten there's really not yeah, that much but it feels time like forever. but it feels like forever and that's so yeah. bad <laughs> yeah no i'm right there with you like a normal show we could salvage out of the numenor plot line especially the numenor plot line uh, the Aragian plotline and the Dwarven plotline, but I still think, and we we even really saw it. It's like, why are they adding hobbits to this show? It doesn't. They don't need hobbits in the Second Age. We saw it then, prior to season one, and we see it now. It's just, why did they add these guys to to the Second Age? If they wanted Gandalf, honestly, I was thinking about it earlier today. They could have had Gandalf by himself arrive from the West just earlier than he does in the canon, and have him be a major player. And that would be fine. Have him have character arcs and stuff. That would be great. But why, why, oh, why did they add the, the Harfoots and the stores and then do absolutely nothing with them? So this, that actively detracts from the score at large, in my opinion. So, yeah, I think if, if you exclude them and honestly, I'm like, this is kind of a, a larger thing. But if they made a supercut without the Harfoots, the show goes up, in my opinion. And if they made a supercut of the show that's a couple hours long, whether it's season one and two or all the seasons when they all release a supercut of the best episodes, I actually think there's a an, a nine out of ten show buried somewhere in this show. I think it needs a little bit more with enough editing to do that. I think there needs to be some some more changes, some more stuff shot. I think you need to make Sauron a much more sinister and like machinating character behind a lot of the scenes. But it's you're right. It's fair, but I think it's if possible, I think with proper right? cutting, like if they cut, if imagine Ryan, how much better would the season be if they just cut that first scene from episode one? True. So you're and, so, and then, you're so it, right? real for that. Um. <laughs> right, like, like I think there's a way to edit the footage we've got now because they did it with the Hobbit trilogy and they somebody on YouTube like made it a way, way shorter and way better, apparently. I still need to watch it, but um, from what I've heard, right? And so I wonder with proper edits, proper cuts of certain scenes to make a character seem a bit different uh, because we don't have what some of Rings of Power has given us, a good hour and a half like movie of the second age or whatever it is, I wonder if this would be super good. So that keeps me holding on to hope for Rings of Power is that maybe at the end we could have a super cut that's actually phenomenal. Um, <sighs> but for what for what they give us for too much, right? It's, uh, nope. So um, any final thoughts on any of this, Roy? Shout out to my boy, Arondir. Shout out to yeah. my boy, Elendil. You guys are the yep. real ones. The Shout dudes. out to Celebrimbor. You're doing it. Even, you know, I'll say it. Shout out to Anatar. You guys are doing some heavy lifting <laughs> in the show. Oh, yeah. But, man, it's... Shout out to Celeborn, wherever he is. Dude. He's in, he's in the sky <laughs> watching us now. But, like, <laughs> shout out to those characters. They're doing so much. Uh, um, rip in the chat for Galadriel. There is there is a cool character in there somewhere. But, man, do they yeah. just not want to show you being a cool character <laughs> at all. Everything you have to do it just has to be unlikable. Um, yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Uh, so, it's Ryan. so much weight. Yeah, we're sticking with a 4 out of 10 on this one. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> cool. Four out of ten. Such That's a, where I'm at, too. Such so. a fall from grace from last episode. It is. It is. Literally, we gave that last episode a nine out of ten, which, again, I hold by that or an eight out of ten. It was it was really it's good. And now, uh, eight and a half, nine. I, I can't yeah. say it's ten. There's too much. There was too much going on then. Yeah. We talked yeah, about it now. For sure. We were worried about some stuff. And, yeah, we're back. <laughs> yep. So there it is. Uh, my friends, let us know what you all think. Royan, thanks for joining me, man. As always, we got two more episodes left, so look forward to reviewing those with you and then doing some sort of live stream um, about the whole season. So looking forward to that, man. Yup. Can't wait. We got a podcast coming yes, up, sir. too. So. Yes. Thank you for the – yeah, so there we go. If you guys want to check out our podcast every month, even off off season from Rings of Power, every month for the last like 70-something 70, 70 months – We've done uh, a podcast, and so if you guys like hearing us talk and chat about Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth, all that stuff, please check out our Patreon and our YouTube memberships. Thanks to our Valar tier patrons and YouTube members as well. Brian Hunley, Peter Shepard, John Hume, Reese Jenkins, Arthur Merlin, Theodore, Andrew Carlisle, and Zumi. My friends, thank you all for joining us on this adventure. Until the next one.